The reading today is from Ephesians 1, verse 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening, everyone. It's amazing uh, to be here. Yeah, as Stephen said, my name is Kira, and uh, I've come from HTB, just down the, down the M40 a little bit this evening uh, to be with you. And I was remembering as I was driving along, I was trying to think, when was the last time I was in Oxford? And I think it was a lot longer than I thought. I I think the last time I was here was for my Oxford interview. That was a long time ago now. And it was at Brazenose College. Anyone here know Brazenose or know of it? That's probably a good thing about the next thing that I'm going to say, because I have to confess, I hated every moment of it. And I must clarify, This had nothing at all to do with Oxford, the city, or the college, I now realize, and everything to do with the fact that I had no idea who I was or what I wanted. I was a terrified 17-year-old chasing after the blessings that I thought I ought to pursue and finding myself in what turned out to be all the wrong battles. So I often think Paul, in our passage tonight, is praying basically directly for me as much as he was to the Ephesians 2,000 years ago. As he writes, I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened. Because fast forward a few years from those days uh, here, and I found myself sitting on a bench in a really lovely little churchyard in West London, saying a prayer myself. It was from a 12-step program. Some of you might recognize it. I prayed, God, I offer myself to you to build with me and do with me as you will. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do your will. The only problem with this, that when I said this prayer, I didn't actually believe in God. I had no idea who I was praying to. The eyes of my heart definitely had not been enlightened. But all I did know was that I had reached the end of myself. And I was willing to do anything to see a change in my circumstances, so much so that I found myself handing my will and my life over to a God that I didn't yet believe in. I didn't know it yet, but I was desperately in need of what is Paul's greatest priority in his prayer in this passage, to know Jesus and to get to know him better and better. It's what puts Paul on his knees, giving thanks and praying for the Ephesians, that they would not just know about Jesus, but they would know him, really know him. In fact, the Greek word for this, used for it, it comes from epignosis. It's like meaning precise and exact knowledge, to know fully and completely. Paul shifts from the first 14 verses that... uh, 
that Sai was talking about last week, celebrating all that God has done, that they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing, that they're adopted, redeemed, forgiven, chosen. And he's now saying, how can I help you realize all of this in a deeper way? How can you really know Jesus? The priority for Paul is not just knowing intellectually, but that the eyes of our hearts are opened. Why is this so important? I think because perhaps there's a tendency, whether you never come to church, whether you just wandered in tonight, whether you had a dream perhaps, or if you're here every week and are part of this community, that you would say you're part of this community, there's a tendency to know about him, even a lot about him, but not really know him. It's really possible to possess a lot of information about God, but not any sensation in your heart. And that is why Paul prays specifically for three things that will enable us to go from head knowledge about Jesus to the heart knowledge of really knowing him. He prays first that we know the hope to which we are called Because when we know that, it will enable us to see the present, the present reality, the way God sees it. Two, he prays that we would know the riches of our inheritance. Because when we know that, we'll be able to see ourselves as God sees us. And third, he prays that we would know God's incomparably great power because that is when we'll be able to see the future as God sees it. And I knew none of these things. First, the hope. Paul prays that we would know the hope to which we are called. I think everybody in here is a hope-based creature. Whatever we have placed our hope in for the future shapes our present. It's driving our vision, it's driving our actions. Who has a five-year plan or has ever thought about your future? Your five-year plan, the big picture, should shape the present. Jesus says in Luke 12, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. The question is, where is our treasure? In what are we placing our hope? Because before I knew Jesus, I was placing my hope in all of the wrong things. Achievement, approval from others, career, relationships, money. And relatively speaking, I was really blessed. I had a career that I loved, great family, friends, but I also knew that there was something missing. A deep sense of not knowing quite who I was or where I belonged. And life kind of felt like a constant series of battles that I couldn't quite conquer. Despite doing everything, the world told me that I should. I'd had various careers ran marathons, climbed mountains, moved countries, all in an effort to escape the emptiness and the niggling voice inside me, getting loudly, saying, surely there must be something more. Why? Because none of the things in which I placed my hope fully satisfied, everyone could be taken away in the blink of an eye. But Jesus says, I am the constant. He is the only thing that you can really put your trust in. Put your hope in something that is certain, that will never fail. He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And the degree to which we know that is the degree to which we will receive the peace, the joy, the contentment that we longed that we long for that i longed for to really know jesus you need to know the hope to which you have been called that you have been called into a great the great narrative of god's salvation plan that your life is not an accident 
There is nothing random about who you are or what is going on in your life right now. You need to know that he's working everything for your good and your glory and his glory. That even in the difficult times, those battles that you face are part of his loving plan for you. Your purpose, your part, why you're here at this time. When you know Jesus, you're called to make the reality of Jesus greater and greater wherever you are, be it Oxford, be it wherever you might end up. In speaking up, in working against injustice, ending poverty, in bringing his kingdom here on earth. We're called to use our intellect, our career, our money, our influence as part of, the li- of living out the hope to which we have been called, not as ultimate goals towards which we strive. When everything around us and the prevailing culture and circumstances tell us only of the battle, of the grind, that there is no hope, let's have our eyes opened, our hearts opened to see reality, the present reality, the way God sees it, the hope and the blessings to which we are called. Second, Paul prays that we would know the riches of our inheritance. And for me, anyway, I think that means being able to see myself as God sees me. Not, it's not an, oh, what am I going to get at the end kind of inheritance. It's knowing the inheritance that we have access to right now. Romans 8.17 says that we are co-heirs with Christ. The implication of this is that God values me as his child. One of the biggest obstacles to going from, inf- going from information about Jesus to sensation A lot of knowing him but not really knowing him is related to me not being able to see myself as Jesus sees me. And many of us might be still living in the shame and the guilt of the past. Some early trauma related to an extensive history of addiction in my family left me feeling like I was never quite good enough. On the outside, I was academically ambitious, sensible, organized, had it all together. This was all stemming from a desperate need for outside approval. But that meant that the inside was lonely, empty, and ended up doing really self-destructive things. Waking up the next day with a deep pit in my stomach and an ever-increasing sense of shame. Never feeling quite good enough The thing is, if we allow the expectations of others, of parents, co-workers, colleagues, teachers, our friends, or the critique of others to drown out the applause of heaven, we'll never really see ourselves as God sees us. But God, but Paul is saying, do you really know that you are an heir with Jesus Christ. In other words, do you really know that you are in his eyes tonight as holy and as blameless and as loved as you will be a thousand years from now? And when you truly come to believe and know that, then you will be able to see yourself as God sees you unconditionally loved as his child, forgiven. And nothing will be able to shake that. Romans 8 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Listen to that feedback and it will heal you. He will open the eyes of your heart and you will know him better and better. So, know the hope to which you have been called. Know the riches of your inheritance. And finally, to know the incomparably great power. This is the power which will help us to see the future as God sees it. We have access to the power over death. 
And for me, this was one of the biggest obstacles I had to overcome in coming to really know Jesus. Because how could anybody feasibly believe that a man could die and be buried and then come back to life again? But as I said earlier, I'd reached a point in my life when I was pretty much willing to try anything, even pray. And in his grace, God stepped in and he began acting and working in my life before I even knew who he was. Because about a year after I'd said that first prayer in that churchyard, an old friend, I actually have to say, it was an ex's mum, so, <laughs> suggested that I try the Alpha course. And I thought, you know what, maybe it's a sign. I had seen the signs outside churches for years, and I thought, oh, I really, I think, would love that, but there's no way I'm going in with a load of judgmental and crazy Christians. I confess, that is what I thought. And part of that course was a weekend away, and on that Saturday morning of that weekend, we read about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. They sounded amazing, but I still doubted that if there was a God, that I could have any of those. But then as I listened to the others in my group, something began to happen. A power came into that room and it filled it and it filled me. Tears began to roll down my cheeks. All the pain and the doubt and the self-loathing and the emptiness that I had felt for so long came pouring out of me. And it was replaced with an overwhelming sense of God's love for me. I thought that to be a Christian, you had to abandon all reason and sanity, but I could not deny what had happened to me in that room. Every question that I had was answered. The hole in me was filled, and I experienced a power and a love like I'd never known. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is the power that Paul is talking about, that power that is yours, it's mine, because we are his co-heirs, the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And Paul is saying that if you're gonna know the hope to which you've been called, the riches of your inheritance, if you're gonna have the eyes of your heart opened to see the future the way that God sees the future, if you're really going to know Jesus, you must appropriate into your life that in God's eyes, you have already been raised with Jesus. You are in him. Nothing can touch you. Any battle you might face pales in comparison with defeating death itself. And Paul says, do you know that? Not just up here, but in your heart, because that knowledge will conquer all fear, all inadequacy, all striving. The power of the resurrection conquers the fear of death in all of us. And then Paul gives us this vision from verse 20 of Jesus at the right hand of God the Father, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, that he has that position of honour and favour So we can understand that his resurrection means not just that Jesus is going to live forever, but that he's going to reign forever. He's not just the resurrected saviour of the world, but the resurrected king. Every authority, every dominion is under his feet, and that power lives within us by the Holy Spirit. So there is nothing that we cannot do by that same spirit. Once we understand that, then the church isn't just a nice community of people who've had their sins forgiven. But as one writer puts it, the church is called to be a community that sees every battle as an opportunity to be awakened and to awaken others to a hope for a better future with Jesus as king. 
When we know the incomparably great power of the Spirit within us, we can dare to imagine the incredible possibilities of the reign of Jesus as King. The possibilities for justice, for peace, for fairness, for equity, for all that our world so desperately needs. To see the future the way God sees the future is not to be a person of despair when we see the injustice and the evil in the world. Because every power, every authority, every dominion is now under his feet. What is true now in heaven at this moment will one day flood the cosmos and be true here on earth. And everything other than the power of Jesus Christ will be defeated. You see, if you're here and you're kind of not sure about this Christianity thing, you might even have been sitting here in your head arguing with me, saying, you know, you, she's saying Jesus is the priority. Yeah, it's all about knowing him. But yeah, I mean, he's an all right guy. Why is it so much about him? He had some great teachings, but he's just another one of many religious figures. No. The thing is, Jesus didn't see himself that way. Jesus didn't see himself as some philosopher, as some teacher. Jesus says, I am the king. We can't put Jesus in a category of a great philosopher because he doesn't give us that option. He said he was the son of God. C.S. Lewis puts it like this. He said, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd be either a lunatic or he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. But let's not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. It seems to me obvious that he was either a lunatic or a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. There are a lot of great teachers in the world. I'm sure everyone at Oxford in Oxford can appreciate that. We do not need any more of those. But we do need something much greater than that. And this is important because Paul's giving us a vocabulary with which we can begin to understand how the world works, what's really going on. That the struggles that we face in our hearts are not just about the conflicts that we have with one another, but there are powers at work in our lives that only Jesus can conquer. He puts it late, later in the letter. Paul says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, and the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. Okay, things got quite real. We don't like to always talk about some of this stuff, spiritual forces of evil. I know it might sound a little bit more like the latest Netflix vampire series, but something we do often talk about is our demons. Like when we're awake at 3 a.m. alone with our thoughts and those dark corners we see in our own heart and we have those kind of troubling thoughts and we're asking, where does this come from? Why am I still struggling with this? Whatever it might be. Or if we look at our news feeds and see the unspeakable things that are happening all over the world. Paul is saying, you will never understand all that in the world and you'll never come to overcome your own despair unless you know the power of Jesus Christ who has overcome all the powers of this world. The main way that information about Jesus becomes sensation in your heart is to understand the source of that power. When was the coronation of Jesus as the king? Where did he begin his reign? And it's at the cross. Because Paul says the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are saved, the cross is the power of God. Just visualize it for the moment. It's, it's the least powerful vision you can have. A man, naked, nailed to a cross, completely unable to defend himself. And Paul is saying that it is there 
that the cross, the cross is what unleashed the power that has overcome all powers. How? Because we all know, even in our own relationships, that the power in a relationship comes from sacrificial love. When you sacrifice yourself or something of yourself for somebody else because you love them, it releases a power in that relationship. And so the God of the universe, who created the universe, says, I'm going to unleash the greatest power of the universe for love. Jesus said in Matthew 26, don't you realize I could ask my heavenly power for angels to come at any time to deliver me and instantly he'd answer me by sending more than 12 legions of angels to come and protect us. Jesus knew his power. And when you know that, Jesus could have called upon all the power that he had under his feet to save himself, but he didn't because he loved you. He loves you. That changes everything. He was the most powerful human being who ever lived, and yet there he was on the cross, his blood spilling for you and for me. That is the power that has defeated all powers, the cosmic sacrificial love of Jesus Christ on the cross. It is that and that alone that will turn the information about Jesus into the sensation of his love. That is what takes our head knowledge and drives it into our hearts. So I pray now, as Paul did, Lord God, open the eyes of our hearts. Help us to know the hope to which we've been called, to see reality as you see it, to know the inheritance of your riches and to take hold of them. Help us to see ourselves the way you see us and to know the incomparably great power that raised Jesus from the dead so that we may know Jesus and know that there is nothing, no battle, no struggle, that you have not already defeated and that we will not be able to face by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Amen.